on climate change. And uh, we're going to hear from uh, our panelists in just a short while uh, as they give us their take on, on climate change. This is all about sparking a discussion and reflection about local climate change issues and resiliency efforts and to make connection with relevant local individuals and organizations and groups. Uh, we're supported. This is uh, supported. In Your Neighborhood initiative is supported by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. Our friends there have been very helpful over the years. Additional funding uh, for this forum and Facing the Future documentary provided by WNET's Peril and Promise initiative. Peril and Promise, the challenge of climate change, is a cross-platform public media project from WNET in New York. Promotional support provided by TEDx Cape May, which will be having its next event in this theater on Sunday, October 20th. And a special thank you to the Lower Cape May Regional High School, John Dretchen, Jenny Lane, and Mark Mallet. And thank you to Dr. Marjorie K. Dr. Marjorie B. Kaplan, rather, Associate Director, Rutgers Climate Institute for, and Devin Griffiths, uh, Communication Director at the Wetlands Institute for helping us organize this panel. The views, as they say, expressed in this program do not necessarily reflect the views of the sponsors. We are live streaming this on njtvonline.org. Uh, we are also uh, accepting folks on Twitter, so uh, feel free to hashtag some comments you hear tonight. That's hashtag NJTVIYN. And I uh, certainly want to thank all of you for showing up uh, this evening, as uh, the big impetus for this is the PBS uh, series, Peril and Promise. I want to introduce you to uh, the folks who are here this evening on our panel, and these are folks who know what they're talking about when it comes to climate change, and they can put a real face a real eye, a real ear, a real nose on the impact of climate change. Um, up first, Dr. George D. Ferdinando, Jr. He is the chair of the Princeton Board of Health and has been active in creating that community's recently released climate action plan just on Monday of this week. He's a member of the steering committee of the NJ Climate Change Alliance and lectures on the impact of climate change on health for public and professional groups. Dr. Yes, please feel free. Yes. Dr. Daphne Monroe is Associate Professor in Shellfish Fisheries and Aquaculture at Rutgers University. Where would we be without this great state university? Uh, Dr. Daphne Monroe worked as an instructor at Vancouver Island University in British Columbia, and prior to that did coastal ecology in Hokkaido. I got it right, didn't know. Hokkaido, Japan. Her research focuses on shellfish ecology and coastal food production systems like fisheries and aquaculture. She has worked on projects at New Jersey Oyster and Clam Farms and the Surf Clam Scallop and Oyster Fisheries. Dr. Monroe. <laughs> Jenny Shin is program coordinator at Haskin Shellfish Research Laboratory also at Rutgers University. Jenny's MS thesis research focused on community-based oyster restoration. Her current work includes monitoring living shoreline projects along the Delaware Bay, as well as developing and implementing K-12 classroom and field marine science programs, and that's an important place to start. Jenny, thank you. And last and certainly not least, Dr. Lenora Tedesco. She's the executive director of the Wetlands Institute in Stone Harbor, New Jersey. Dr. Tedesco has focused her research and conservation activities on coastal and wetland ecosystem dynamics and restoration. Current projects include restoring critical habitat for colonial and marsh nesting birds, evaluating water chemistry of beneficial use, marsh restoration projects, and evaluating the impact of sea level rise on wetlands and coastal ecosystems. Dr. Tedesco, welcome. And as we get started this evening, we want to play for you, if you haven't seen this, this is um, part of the Peril and Promise uh, documentary that was just done and just aired recently on NJTV and WNET. Climate change is real, it's here, it's caused by humans, 
That's the conclusion of no less than three major scientific reports in as many months that warn the world is failing to make sufficient progress to avoid the worst effects of climate change. They predict if humans keep pumping carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, here's just a fraction of what could happen. Here's zero feet, right? Yeah. Here's what seas four feet higher would swallow. Six feet. Nine feet, the level Sandy reached, would submerge Port Newark, the airport, much of Jersey City, and set off a cascade that could wash out homes and businesses, impede power lines, and cut off the supply lines for goods coming into the harbor. Dr. Robert Kopp is director of the Rutgers Institute of Earth, Ocean, and Atmospheric Sciences and lead author of Volume 1 of the Fourth National Climate Assessment, the basis for the newly released climate report that warns of potential devastation to our coasts, economy, and health. This is really a doomsday scenario. That 10 feet dearly would be a doomsday scenario, and it's hard to get to, right? It requires that we have unchecked fossil fuel emissions growth globally and that we're unlucky in Antarctica. Devastation increases with each ton of carbon dioxide we pump into the atmosphere. To stabilize the climate, we ultimately need to get our emissions down to zero and taking active measures to deal with the impacts. Impacts that appear irreversible in the short term, say 20 years, because several greenhouse gases, especially carbon dioxide, can stay in the atmosphere for decades, causing rising temperatures, rising seas, and intensifying storms. The report shows warmer air temperatures, shortened seasons, and increased rainfall already hurting forestry and farming, threatening the food supply. Winters in New Jersey are warming faster than summers, in fact about three times as fast according to the National Climate Assessment. And what that means is that we're seeing earlier springs, but winter is still winter, right? It still gets cold in the winter and will even with global warming. Um, that means we have more frequently early buds followed by cold snaps and that can be quite damaging to fruit crops. Warmer seas are already hurting fisheries down the shore, and more extreme storms and surges are eroding beaches and putting added stress on aging critical infrastructure in cities. And all of it is threatening the health and well-being of New Jersey residents. That's from the Peril and Promise uh, documentary. I'm, I'm curious, I, I'm gonna start this off tonight. Is there anybody out here who doesn't believe the science of climate change. That's what I thought. All right, uh, let's start. Uh, Dr. Tedesco, uh, what are some of the changes in temperature, precipitation, and sea level we're experiencing in New Jersey? The hard facts, doctor. Just the facts. Well, good, after good evening, everyone, and thanks for coming out to learn a little bit more about this topic. Um, I think you heard a little bit of the, of the information was presented on that film, but um, a couple of the things um, is uh, if you think about mean temperature, so on an annual basis, the average temperature in New Jersey, that temperature is rising faster than the global averages, so we're kind of in a, in a hot spot, if you will, and I guess right now we're about three and a half degrees Fahrenheit warmer on average than we were in the early 1900s. So when you hear those stories from your parents that they walked uphill both ways to school in the snow, there probably was a little bit of truth to that. Um, rainfall patterns, I think, are really interesting. In the Northeast, we've seen an increase in what we call the intense rainfall events. So these are kind of the 1% rainfall event when you get intense um, rainfall, both in the number of inches in an event as well as the number of inches per hour. So these, you know, it rained three inches and it was an inch an hour kind of stuff. Um, we've seen a 55% increase in those kinds of events um, since the mid-50s. And I think you kind of think about that. Even just the other night, every once in a while, right, you keep seeing these urban flood uh, systems where these people's cars are getting flooded and houses are getting flooded. Those are the kinds of things that are uh, climate change. That's kind of climate change in action, if you will, to see those kinds of events. And the frequency of increase of those events is pretty, is pretty significant. And the, the Northeast, that includes us, is the highest, uh, the highest increase in the country. Midwest is looking at about a 45% change, but 55% increases is pretty dramatic. And then uh, when it comes to sea level rise, I like to, to use this graph that I put up here. This is a measured sea level. And um, so you could just think about it. There's a, a sensor out uh, in Atlantic City, and this is a good record because it's such a long record, but you could look at Cape May's record, and you know there's gauges up and down the coast, and it basically measures every day. Every 15 minutes, it measures the level of the water, the same way your gas tank when your car. There's a float in there that measures how high the water is. So this is measured. Um, and I find that's a good thing to do because as 
that's just the record. It's not a model. It's not guessing what it's going to be. It's not projecting. That's measured sea level. And when you look at that, you can see it's a noisy record, but you could also see you take the average line and sea level's risen quite a bit. Um, and in fact, since the, for instance, since the um, 1980s, we're looking at about six inches of rise here. The other interesting thing is, again, of course, New Jersey is rising faster than the global rise rate. And the other thing we see when you start looking into the numbers is that the rate of rise in the last 25 years or so is more than double the rate that it was earlier in the first 100 years or so of, the, of, of this record. So we're rising at a faster rate. We're rising faster than the global averages. And since 1965, the, we've actually seen uh, we're at a rise rate of a foot and a half a century. And that's a pretty big number when you live in Cape May or in big portions of New Jersey where you're, we're very low lying along the coastal regions. The projections are that we'll see an additional 1 to 1.8 feet of rise on the, from where we are now by 2050. Okay, so those are big numbers, and this, this rate of rise is what has people concerned. So we're talking about any time we have a storm event, the base level is just higher. So we start at a higher level each time we go. So the rate of rise is accelerating. We see that in the marshes. You see that if you talk to people, if you drive around these coastal areas. It used to be a big deal when the, when the meadows flooded. I hear people say, well, you know, people used to come out to see the meadows flood. It used to happen a couple of times a year. Now that happens 8, 10, 12 times a month. And if you think about what that means for coastal inundation, what we like to call nuisance flooding, this is when kind of on a, on a sunny day there's water in the streets of the Barrier Islands and low-lying areas. That used to happen, that kind of so-called nuisance flooding in Atlantic City is an example, used to happen two days a year in the 1950s. By 2000, that was happening more than 20 days a year, and it's increasing ever still. So, so these are just kind of how it affects you, and maybe I think it's important for people to see climate change, and I think these are the ways that if you start connecting that, I've seen that, I, I, I get that, and that in fact is a product of climate change. And Dr. Tedesco, what's causing the sea to rise like that? So, so that's a, a good question. Actually, many factors go into sea level rise. Um, you start with um, any time you have ice that's on land and it melts, that adds water to the oceans. Um, and this is important because if you think about it, if you take a glass um, and you put ice cubes in it and the ice melts, it doesn't raise the water in your glass, right? Because that ice is already offset. It's displaced the water. So floating ice, sea ice, doesn't change the, the, the rising levels. But what does is land ice. So any glaciers that are on land, so the Antarctic land ice, Greenland ice, any of the glaciers, you've seen pictures of glaciers melting. That water is being added to the oceans. But we also have other things. As the oceans warm, warm water expands. So on a scale, on ocean scales, that matters and that adds to it. And then along the coastlines, we also have other changes. If, if ocean currents start to shift, which they have been doing, that changes where the water is. It's kind of a bathtub. If you think of the ocean as a bathtub, water sloshes around. And as the currents move, some of the water comes closer to shore just by currents kind of sloshing up against the shoreline. All of those things are physical water changes. And then we also have changes where the land is moving. So in places, um, specifically in New Jersey, one of the reasons it's rising faster here is the land is actually sinking. Um, that's related to a product of the old ice ages, so a long time ago. And then in some places where they're um, extracting water for groundwater, we actually get subsidence or land sinking because they're actually just drawing water. I think about drawing water out of a sponge, the ground sinks because of that. So all of these complex factors come into play to tell us what's happening locally, um, and they're big variables. So what kind of changes are taking place in, in the coastal areas and the wetlands and so forth as a result of all this? So if I already mentioned the marshes are flooding more frequently. They're flooding to deeper depths, and they're flooding to longer time periods. And if you think about a wetland or a beach, they're effectively zero. They are zero level, right? They know where the ocean level is, and they're adapted to be there. And the reality is their sea level moves. Sea level cha always changes. And for most of the time, those ecosystems can keep up with sea level but they do so over very narrow ranges of elevation. So if we were to let our beaches and our marshes move, we would be okay. But instead, we've built infrastructure and roadways and houses, and we said, no, this is where our beach is going to be. So our barrier islands can't move. And when they try to move, they do so during storm events. 
So they try to step back up so the beach is back to zero. But we don't let them do that. And in fact, after Sandy, when all the beaches tried to move landward, you saw all the pictures of sand and every big storm, right? There's bulldozing the sand back to the beach. Well, that's the beach trying to get into shallower water. And a product of that is why we see so much beach erosion. So all the work we do to restore beaches and all the money that the Army Corps puts into all the beach nourishment that's happening is to try to put the beach back where it belongs. So one of the products of that is drowning shorelines um, on our beaches, and it's just going to cost us a lot of money to keep them there. And the other thing is the marshes themselves are also drowning. They're in deeper water. And some of them are starting to fail and starting, and starting to, to literally to drown. They can also move landward. So in places where your marsh can walk landward into higher ground, they do so. And you can see that sometimes by what we call ghost forests. If you're driving along a marsh edge, you can see the dead trees. Those are dead trees that died because of the salt inundation. Um, it can happen in farmlands, and it becomes a problem uh, with contaminating groundwater. So freshwater resources are becoming saltier, and that's a challenge. There's, there's towns where that has already occurred. Cape May, we're here in Cape May. Um, you guys have a desalinization plant because the groundwater has been contaminated by salt. So, so these are the, the ecosystems are responding to this. The challenge we have is that the rate of rise, I talked about that increase in the rate of rise, that rate of rise is now exceeding these ecosystems' abilities to keep up. So people are now starting to be concerned about marsh loss, marsh drowning, um, more salt water in places, and that in turn is affecting things like fisheries and nursery grounds, and, and you know, my, my colleagues here will speak more about those aspects. But the whole Doctor, systems are changing. Pardon me, Dr. Tedesco. How, how much did Hurricane Sandy speed things up the, in, in terms of impact, in terms of rising sea level, or, or, or telling us about, uh, uh, about climate change and future storms like that? So Sandy, Sandy was an, an interesting event, and I think I, I would caution you not to say, you know, what, what, what did Sandy do to, to elevate things? I think what Sandy actually did in some weird ways was did us a favor because it woke people up to the need to start addressing some of these things. And we were kind of way behind as a state from a lot of other states in addressing climate change and thinking about sea level rise and coastal resilience. We weren't talking that much about coastal resilience until Sandy. But it turns out if you look at some of the numbers for Sandy, human-caused sea level rise during Sandy was responsible for about $5 billion in direct damage. That was 18 percent of the bill from Sandy was because of that sea level rise. And effectively, it exposed another 39,000 people in the state to direct impacts. So that if you were to take off, and that's basically saying because of the human component of sea level rise, the water base level was already higher, and then you have Sandy come in, and it just pushed water further in. If we were to take, if, we were to, if it was 1880, just for an example, and we had a Sandy, the exact same storm, same position, everything was the same about the storm except for the amount of sea level rise. We would have flooded 27 less miles of coastline. Wow. So you start to think about it. And in that scenario, you're talking more than 80,000 people were impacted that wouldn't have been if sea level were at the 1880 percentages. So if you just start thinking as you go forward, we, there's projections for increased storm intensity and frequency, and as we continue to add water to that base level, then those storms have the ability to cause more damage because they can push more water into further in, into other places and push, push water and flood, flood further. Do people get it? I think these people get it. Yes. Um, so in, in some ways, I, I think um, the challenge I've found with people is they some people are, people that are connected to what's going on around them see change. But I think the challenge is they may not understand the change they're seeing is, in fact, a product of climate change. Right. So, yeah, it's raining a lot more. The waters, you know, the tides are flooding more. Um, they're seeing, you know, every time you turn on the news now, right, there's some pretty big catastrophic weather event. And, and But I don't think people say, well, that's... That's, that's climate change is happening. So I think finding a way to, for people to connect to that and to see that change and to connect that the change that people are seeing in their own lives, in their daily lives, and see that's climate change, I think that's how people get it. So we just got to kind of connect the dots more. And, and I'm curious, the model you have here, how does this compare to other regional or national models about sea rise level? Are they all pretty much in... in so, so this is a specific, this isn't a model, this is measured. Okay? Measured. But okay. this is, so in, um, it's basically from New York to the north, the rate of rise is slower than it is here. Um, and that's because of that 
land sinking thing in addition to some of the other factors. From about New Jersey south, it's almost twice what it is. New Jersey to Virginia, it's twice what it is to New York in the northeast. So from a regional perspective, we're in, we're in one of the places that sea level is rising fast. Um, there are places it's rising faster. You go down to New Orleans, the land is sinking even faster, so their rate of rise is, is much higher. Yeah, but we I, are higher than, um, than many places in the U.S. I, was, I used to live in Louisiana, and I was going to ask you about that because um, I, I remember when I worked there uh, 10, 15 years ago, one of the things that they kept impressing upon us is that if you go back to a map of, say, 1995 or 1980 or something like that, you could see some of the small islands out there off Plaquemines Parish and, and, and so forth. And then you fast forward to 2010, fast forward to 2015, and these places, they're gone. They're gone. Is that also a result of, of taking things out of the ground, such as uh, extracting oil and, and, and so forth? So, so New Orleans is a, is a very complex area. The, there's a series of things happening there. First, it's marsh land, so it's ready right at zero, effectively. Right. Um, but in, in Louisiana, the other thing that happened is um, marshes build. Let me just bet, marshes build in two different ways. They grow plants, so good root structure helps them kind of stand up and keep up with sea level. And the other way they do it is they trap mud. Um, kind of think of a shag carpet, right? You kind of get a lot of dirt gets hung up in the shag carpet. Well, that's what the marsh plants do. They trap mud, so they build up that way. So you need a healthy influx of sediment into your marsh systems to help them keep up. In Louisiana, when they levied and the entire Mississippi, what happened is they prevented any floods, any of that mud from washing up onto the marshes, which it had been doing for, you know, millennia until they did that. So, so the Army Corps' levees actually cut off that supply of mud. So they basically starved the marshes so that they couldn't keep up with sea level. So it's sea level rise, a lack of sediment being put in to help the marshes keep up. And in addition, then, they have extraction that's of oil as well as water is also causing subsidence. Houston is sinking. So some of these cities are sinking, but, but in a large part it is sea level rise to those places. So anytime you're really close to sea level, you're seeing these effects much more because it's a, a shallow. If you think about that, the, the more level the land is, a small rise of, of sea level will flood a lot further compared to California, even though sea level is rising there. Right. There are steep beaches, so a small rise only comes up a little bit. Great. Thank you to Dr. Tedesco. Uh, let's focus now on sustainability of coastal and marine ecosystems. Um, Dr. Daphne Monroe. Uh, doctor, uh, how does climate affect and shape ecosystems? Um, yeah. um, yes. Thank you for having me tonight. Yes. Um, and thank you all for coming. Um, I think this is a really important conversation. Um, so climate, of course, uh, in a lot of the ways that um, we just heard, uh, the, the ecosystem is tuned to climate. Hold um, your mic a little bit closer, if you will. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, yes. The ecosystem, of course, is tuned to the climate. The temperatures that, that an ecosystem experiences, um, the precipitation that comes into an ecosystem, all of these things matter to the biology that lives there, the plants and the animals. And so um, you, that's why you don't see the same kinds of ecosystem here that you would see maybe down in Louisiana or maybe up right. in Canada. Um, so that, that's how climate shapes, you know, the, the kind of drivers would be things like salinity in, in the coastal um, zone, salinity and temperature um, would be some of those major climate factors for ecosystems. Environmental loss in the Delaware Bay Shore and Cape May, what's the impact in terms of uh, on oysters and, and, and so forth? You said environmental loss. Yes, um, environmental loss. Well, um, I think that that's kind of, that's a, kind of a very broad um, question, but I'll give I'll give an example, um, and it kind of follows from what we just heard about. Um, one of the things was uh, that was mentioned was in increasing rainfall events. Yes. Um, and so one of the fisheries that I work very closely with, I'm very fortunate to um, have close relationships with the oyster fishery in Delaware Bay. Um, sustainable fishery. Um, has been fishing oysters sustainably for, for decades. Um, and these guys, a lot of them are, uh, you know, multi-generational fishing families. So they've been fishing these oysters for a long, long time. They know um, these ecosystems very well. Um, one of the things that it doesn't seem like it would be a problem, but these increasing storm events and increasing rainfall has a major impact on the oyster stock. The oysters in the bay, in the Delaware Bay, 
all of our oysters are subtitle for the most part, the oysters that they fish. And it's not here in Cape May, it's further up bay. Right. Um, and those parts of the, the bay are subject to very big changes in salinity when we have big rainfall events because the, the bay itself is the outflow of the entire watershed. The watershed's very big. So when there's a big rainfall event like, like we just heard about, these, these big pulses of, of fresh water that come into the, um, the watershed, they move down the bay and they decrease the salinity. If the salinity decreases far enough, the oysters will die. Um, and there's sublethal effects as well. But um, right now, today, we are at day 400 of continuously low salinity over the oyster beds in Delaware Bay because we've just been having rainfall event after rainfall event. And recognizing that we're here today in the Cape May bubble, so sometimes we don't get the rain here, right? The locals know what I mean. Um, but we've been getting a lot of major rainfall events over and over and over again. A lot of it has to do with these big storms that don't, maybe don't make landfall here uh, in New Jersey, but things like uh, hurricanes make landfall in Carolina. And then those, those storms kind of move through the, through the overland and they put um, fresh water into the Delaware estuary. Um, and then, you know, that one storm rolls through and then another storm maybe that makes landfall in the Gulf rolls through and it's one storm after another. And we're in a very, very unique situation right now. Um, and it's, uh, it, the, it appears that the frequency of these kinds of situations have been increasing. Um, and so there's a, there's a major, you know, there's a major interaction there. It's not only just an ecosystem level thing that's going on. There's fishermen's, you know, the, the fishermen that rely on these oysters to, right. for their harvest, for their jobs. This is a coastal food supply that's relatively sustainable. Shellfish is one of those types of food that we can produce either through fisheries, uh, fisheries or aquaculture that's relatively sustainable in terms of protein production. And so um, this is, this is a, in my opinion, I think there's some uh, very kind of unexpected outcomes from things like increasing storm events that, that are kind of, you know, not intuitive, but major, major issues. Do you attribute that to climate change? Absolutely. Yeah. Like, like what we heard um, from Dr. Tedesco, um, these, the climate instability, there's all kinds of things going on. It's not just rising temperatures. We're seeing all kinds of other things like increasing storm frequency, particularly in the Northeast. That's one of the things that is being forecast in terms of climate change here, is that we're going to see more storms. And it appears that we maybe are already seeing that, and it's having real tangible consequences to our local fisheries. What can be done, what is being done right now to counter what you're describing? Um, well, I don't know that there's much that can be done um, to prevent the storms necessarily, but um, in terms of the way that we work with the fisheries, um, you know, we, we monitor things very closely so that we can make management actions that, that can help in, in sustainability, long-term sustainability of the fishery. And I, I will point out that a lot of that is being done in direct collaboration with the fishermen. They're the ones that come and knock on our doors. Uh, we literally are located, my office is located next door. <laughs> they come over and they bring these questions and concerns to us and we work very closely with them and with the management agencies. These, this particular fishery is very collaborative. And so in terms of those kinds of, it's maybe not a solution, but it's at least a way that we can help um, mitigate some of the issues. So we're monitoring the mortality of oysters out in the bay. Um, we're communicating that to the management agencies and the fishermen so that we can make decisions in real time about what's going on in terms of the ecology. Give us an idea what some of those decisions are, what some of those debates are. Um, well, so uh, one of the things that um, uh, it, you would... It, so in terms of a management action, the managers may choose to uh, um, pull back on fishing pressure, knowing that there's this other uh, climate change impact happening, to try to, to try to see if you can, you know, do as little damage as you possibly can. In the case of what's going on right now, we're seeing this impact on the on portions of the stock that are not being fished right now. So it's not at a point where we're, you know, uh, kind of raising the alarm, um, but it's being watched very closely. Another thing that we're working on is um, we're, you know, we have a number of, my, myself and some of my colleagues, have research projects ongoing where we're watching very closely how the oysters themselves may adapt. They may be able to respond to some of these pressures, both through, you know, 
temperature pressures or salinity pressures. So can we expect, you know, can we put some science on the table to help us understand how they may change over time in terms of adaptation or being, you know, being resilient to these things? Of course, they're dying now, but maybe next year the oysters that survive will be more resilient. So we're studying that very closely right now. Is, is it at all feasible, likely, probable, that the oyster population could survive with much lower salinity in the water? That, it, that, that they could actually just survive in fresh water? Well, fresh water, no. But um, it, what's been interesting is we've seen this happen a couple of times, m more frequently than we've expected over the past decade, let's say. Um, and what we're seeing literally right now, this year, the survivors, and there's not very many in the furthest uh, reaches up bay, the survivors are actually doing pretty well. And so that suggests that there may be a capacity that gets built in if they keep getting this stress over and over again. Um, that they're adapting. That they, they, may, they may adapt, yeah. Right. I, I won't say they are adapting. Okay. Um, it's a little too early um, to, to sign off on that. But the capacity is there. Um, oysters are very flexible um, animals. They can live in a lot of different salinities. They can withstand a lot of different temperatures. And so of all of the critters out there, they may have the capacity to do that. And again, we're, we're studying that very closely while, these, uh, while this is going on right now. Now, when will you have conclusive results in your, uh, in, in your study? Because I'm sure there are a lot of people who are anxious to hear about it. Yeah, well, and it's, I, I would, I'll, I'll point out, too, um, that it's not just here. It's not yeah. just Delaware Bay. Um, the fisheries and the oysters in the Chesapeake are experiencing the same phenomenon right now. Um, in the Gulf, um, one of the strategies that they do to deal with, uh, for example, all the flooding that was going on in the Mississippi River this year, um, one of the things that they the, they tend to do as a, a way to protect infrastructure is they open the levees um, and they let that fresh water out. Um, when they do that in the Gulf, that tends to kill oysters. So they're having a very big mortality event down there as well. Wow. Um, and so, so it's not it's not just me and my my colleagues. It's, there's a number of scientists across the country who are looking at these issues. Are um, you guys then? Are you guys in constant communication and sharing notes and so forth? Oh, we we do. Yep. <laughs> we um well we uh, one of the t methods that you know, one of the things that we use to talk to each other are science meetings. So we'll yeah. all get together at science meetings, but we also share uh, results with each other. We talk. Sometimes we'll even even like collaborate on a project that's located in both places. Um, so yeah, it's a it's a very collaborative effort. Yeah. Is this something the federal government is paying attention to in terms of, you know, this is this is serious. We had better pay attention to the research and the scientists who were who were paying attention to this. Um, well, I'll say uh, at least from my part the. One of the research projects that I've been working on um, has been funded through the National Science Foundation. Okay. Um, we often are, uh, get grant funding to address questions like this through um, NOAA, the National Oceanographic Atmospheric Association, and um, and Sea Grant. Um, so there are federal level agencies who are, are recognize the issue insofar as they're willing to put grant dollars towards. Um, addressing it. So I would say yes on that level. And that's enabling you to do your research? Yeah, yeah. Okay, good. Yeah. All right, good. Thank you, Dr. Monroe. Uh, Jenny Shin, um, why are oysters so important to the ecosystem? Hello, everyone. Um, oysters are very important for several reasons. Um, first, as we've discussed, they're important for the local economy and um, the industry and the people that work there, the communities that are um, surrounded near these fisheries. Um, oysters are also very important for the ecosystem because they filter water, um, which is how they eat. And so they're capturing particles in the water and they're reducing nitrogen levels and they're keeping water clarity high, which helps aquatic vegetation and other animals live. They provide habitat for a lot of other animals. So if you can imagine all the nooks and crannies that an oyster reef provides, there will be crabs and shrimp and other creatures, worms living there, and some larger fish will use oysters and the animals that rely on them for habitat as prey. Um, so they're important to the local community in that way. Um, and oysters can be important for shoreline stabilization. Shellfish in general um, can help stabilize shoreline areas and provide some resiliency in all these changing conditions. 
It, it sounds as if they are adapting to a certain extent to, to this environment and to climate change. What would happen if oysters become extinct? Well, that would, <laughs> that would not be um, well received by anyone, really. So you'd have a, a collapse of these local fisheries, of course, having um, socioeconomic impacts to the communities. Um, we would probably see uh, an increase in um, negative water quality impacts in terms of turbidity and high nutrient levels, which may cause algal blooms and low oxygen events in the ecosystem. We may see a reduction in um, fisheries of both commercial and recreational importance as the oysters do provide nursery habitat for a lot of species that are fished commercially and recreationally. Um, so all around, bad story. <laughs> yeah, it sounds like it. How long does it take to restore, rebuild an oyster reef and, and, and population? Um, in terms of s smaller projects that might have a very small footprint for looking at community-based restoration projects, you can, in theory, create a structure and have oysters recruit to that structure within a year or two. But in looking at um, long-term sustainability of the habitat, um, you're looking at a longer time frame in that oysters may have good years and bad years of favorable and unfavorable environmental conditions, um, in which case some will have mortality, others of good growth and recruitment. Um, so I would say over time, the reef structure would be more resilient um, and sustainable as new generations of oysters populate the reef. What kind of living shoreline projects does New Jersey need right now? There are a lot of on-the-ground living shorelines projects actually across the state um, of varying degrees with different agencies, state, federal, um, conservation groups, academia. There's a lot of um, partners at play in living shorelines projects. Um, one Dr. Tedesco mentioned are the, the thin layer um, placement. So if a marsh has a lower elevation that's not supporting the vegetation growth, perhaps some local dredge materials can be sourced and reused in adding a little bit of elevation to the marsh and helping it keep pace with sea level rise. Um, additionally, there are some other tactics on the ground now that use um, bio-based materials that lay along the marsh edge, um, which help reduce wave energy and allow sediment to fall out of the system and assist the marsh edge in keeping pace with sea level rise and facilitating vegetation and shellfish growth. Um, there are also some techniques that are a little bit grayer. So along the spectrum of greener to grayer living shorelines techniques, we can have more hardened shorelines. Um, you might think of a traditional bulkhead or something um, that's a permanent structure that prevents water from entering um, the land. So intermediate to that, there might be kind of a hybrid design that you might think of the ecosystem and nature in designing this. So you may have... Um, smaller rocks or structures that will facilitate shellfish growth um, to allow the interface between the water and land to continue without a stark stopping point. Um, so I think just collaborative efforts amongst communities, townships, and organizations to um, take advantage of some of these tactics that are being explored uh, is valuable right now in the state. What's the cost of a living shoreline project? They vary widely. and. Um, supported by volunteers, many of them are, in which case that can reduce the cost if the um, township or community is supportive of the project and, and can assist that with volunteer labor and efforts, which we do see quite often in some of these community-based events. Um, but in general, to throw a number, you, you could be looking at anywhere from five to $10,000 for a very small nature-based design with greener tactics and a small footprint, all the way up to millions of dollars uh, looking at larger municipality scales and master plans. But given the significance of oysters to the environment, it, 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 the, the price tag is, in your estimation, whether it's $10,000 or a couple million dollars, it's, it's worth it. Um, yeah, I suppose so. I think living shorelines have um, specialized uses. Some of these tactics are not cure-alls, and right. in some scenarios, beach replenishment and things are, are very expensive. And so I think there has to be some discussion and weighing on the pros and cons of using these tactics in certain areas and what the, the value um, received from them turns out to be. There's some current work out that 
work currently going on that's looking at the um, cost effectiveness of living shorelines. And you can't just set them and forget them. Some of these tactics need maintenance, just like a garden or a roadway or sidewalk. They need to be maintained and added to and monitored. So there's that aspect also going into considering the projects and, you know, need to be determined the goal, what the goals of the project are should be quite specific so you can design and engineer the project to be most effective. Now, are some of the community-based initiatives, are they getting input from professionals like you and, and, and Dr. Monroe as well? Yeah, m most of the projects that I've um, heard of from colleagues and involved with myself are very collaborative, and there's multi-agency partnerships with uh, regulatory agencies, New Jersey Department of Environmental Protection, often um, the the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, in addition to um, nonprofit organizations and you know others in the area that are interested in these issues. It sounds like, based on what you're describing, what Dr. Monroe described, and Dr. Tedesco as well, is that there's a real awareness of what this challenge is and what we're up against. There, there are no delusions about what's taking place with with oysters, for instance. I think from my perspective and most people that I interact with, I would agree with your statement. I'm not sure um, that the whole state would agree with that statement, but I think in the groups of people that we deal with, and I'm also involved with a lot of school programs, the students are aware of these issues. They hear about these issues. They're learning about them in school. So I think that's very helpful in um, spreading awareness. Our, our, I'm, I'm curious. Um, in, in your bio here, we read that you work with... Um, uh, implementing K through 12 classroom and field marine science programs, are the children really genuinely interested in um, in the science and in, 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 in what it means? They they get what it means. I, I think for the most part, the students that especially live in communities that are close and to let the me, water. Let me let me let me back up a second. Rephrase my question, pardon me. Okay. Do they realize what's at stake? Um. Probably t in in the large picture, yes. m maybe not as much as as they could. I think okay. in, in smaller scales, like Dr. Tedesco described with localized flooding and things like that, they see it. They know it. Yeah. They may have families that work on the water, especially in South Jersey here. They're, I think they're quite aware of, of the smaller scale issues. But in terms of looking at the broader picture, I think that's a place where the education and outreach can be most effective and um, maybe a, a little more forthcoming. Good. Compare the group you work with, uh, the K through 12, to when you were going through K through 12. Are they more aware than, than when you were in that group? I would say absolutely. Um, I, I don't remember learning about these topics in school. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I think it's definitely on the teachers' minds. It's on, it's on their plates. I think some communities more than others are uh, more open to discussing it. We work with schools, private, public, all sorts, homeschool groups, and so depending on specifically uh, what their background is, they're more or less aware. But um, I, I, I don't remember learning about climate change and sea level rise in grammar school or high school. So right. I, I think that's changed. All right. Thank you, Jenny. I'm going to play another part of this um, Peril and Promise a documentary that aired on NJTV and WNET. Let's take a look. What keeps you up at night? So one of the things that keeps me up at night is what we don't know. Right? There's a lot of potential for the climate system to surprise us as we push it away from the conditions that humans have grown up in as a species and as our global civilization. Um, so the potential for there to be sudden changes or abrupt changes in the climate system, but also the potential for human societies to respond in abrupt ways to increasingly frequent extremes. Wait, what if we have multiple extreme hurricanes in a year, as we have, on top of extreme drought, on top of extreme wildfires? Like, How much of that can a society take? Right? It's what are the social tipping points? And, and that's something I think we have a very poor sense of, but is something I do worry about. Yes, tipping points, what are they? Uh, well. So as I said, I'm actually most worried about the social tipping points. Dr. D. Ferdinando, um, what keeps you up at night? I'm sorry, I missed the question. What keeps you up at night? What keeps me up at night? Um, um, well, the, the, we've talked a lot. Uh, 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 I'll take it back a step and say, and uh, to set some baseline for the people in the audience and the people who are watching and uh, talk about the difference between mitigation and adaptation. 
And mitigation, we've talked some about, and what that really means is changing things that will either decrease or stop climate change. And that's a great goal to have, and talking about decreasing consumption of different activities and uh, modifying our behavior to decrease consumption. But the other one is adaptation, learning to live with uh, some of the problems that were just discussed. So what happens when there are multiple floods uh, or what happens when there are multiple heat events or there's serious air pollution and people get very sick or die from them? Uh, and that ad adaptation to me on the human side in New Jersey the awareness of the amount of adaptation that's going to be necessary for us to survive well as the climate changes, mm -hmm. it seems is actually lagging behind our awareness of our responsibility to mitigate climate change. And so that's what keeps me up at night, is that how many bad events will need to happen where humans are damaged before people go, it's not just not drinking my plastic water bottle, but I have to change how I'm exposed to heat, to the air, to the insects around me. I have to change my own behavior to protect myself, not just to protect the planet. And you're not seeing enough of that? That's my sense. I'm, I'm yes. hopeful because the um, alternative is depressing to not be hopeful. But uh, I'm hearing people talk about, uh, so for instance, we have a climate change program, as you mentioned, uh, in Princeton, New Jersey, small town, 31,000 people. If we have a climate adaptation plan in Princeton, it's not going to mitigate climate change for Mercer County for the state of New Jersey, for the northeastern United States. We talked about this uh, earlier. But it does show that you can do some things to mitigate climate change. But what worries me is the 90-year-old or the 80-year-old a block from my house who has to live three or four days with their power out in 90-degree weather. Mm -hmm. Who knocks on that door? who finds that person before they get too hot to survive. Right. Those are the, those, um, if you will, that's the silent epidemic here of uh, climate change. The climate action plan that Princeton voted on, the board, uh, council voted on, on Monday evening this week, what's your hope for that? That, okay, you, you, Princeton is not a bubble, and, and Princeton takes this action, uh, but is it your hope then that the next town will do it, the next town, the next town, and soon... Mercer County will do something, and then because Mercer County does it, Middlesex County will do it, and then Burlington County will do it. Well, the first thing I would say is, uh, and living in uh, Princeton or in other areas that sometimes get more than their fair share of publicity, um, I make no presumption that ours is the first climate action plan right. or it's the best climate action plan. But the, the, if you will, benefit of that extra attention is that maybe some other uh, individual, groups of individuals, uh, will take that as some impetus to create their own action plan. Our action plan looks at how our workers in our public, um, uh, the, the public works group, how to protect them while they're working. Because they're going to be working out in the world where it's hotter, it's a hotter world, it's a wetter world, it's a world that has a higher level of air pollution. How do you make sure those workers, those men and women, are protected? That's one of the messages that the Climate Action Plan of Princeton uh, talks, speaks to, and we're hoping that that type of adaptation to protect our workers and to protect our citizens, as I mentioned earlier, it, not just the, and I'm hopeful about this, but we do talk about greener buildings, greener commercial buildings, greener home buildings. That's great. That's part of the mitigation process. But also this adaptation of protecting workers and protecting other citizens uh, to survive climate change. I'm hoping both of those will be part of the take-home message. Um, what are some of the other aspects of this, uh, of the climate uh, plan that Princeton, and was the vote unanimous for this? Were, were there any dissenting votes? Um, uh, the 
um, some of the other aspects look at uh, creating uh, local groups uh, in the event of a power outage. Okay. Um, some of these can be called um, uh, local community emergency response groups, which the federal government has been encouraging really p prior to 9-11, but especially after 9-11. Uh, they're called CERT groups, uh, community emergency uh, response teams where you would actually look for, uh, be aware of and look for the most vulnerable in your community if the power is out for an extended period of time, either in a cold event or a warm event. That's one of the uh, events that's, that's part of this from the health point of view. And doctor, are we, are we as, as individuals, this is uh, um, kind of a broad question, are, are we even aware uh, um, one person to the next person, are we even aware of the impact climate change has on us uh, physically, on our health, on our mental health? Are, are we in any way paying attention to anything like that? Well, I would answer that, I would answer that in two ways. Uh, I, I've um, had the opportunity to give talks to groups of physicians, groups of nurses, and groups of public health professionals. And the first thing I remind the uh, physicians, for instance, is that the patients they see actually don't live in the exam room that the doctor is in. So when you go see your doctor, they, they see you in, it's often a white room, they see in a small cubicle, and you, you do need to remind doctors that people are actually living out in the world, they're not living in that exam room. and. I, I don't think it's just the doctors and the nurses and the public health people that think that way. I think we think as we go from our house to our car, from our car to a parking lot, from a parking lot to a shop, we're, we're really changing the environment that we're living in. And um, I know I tend to look at only the horror stories. Uh, and my wife or my children will tell you that I'm always reading some paper, some news report, and you know, focusing on some terrible event. But just in recent days with the heat events, right. there are young people who died of heat exposure in relative, what I would consider low temperatures. Someone working outside in 92 degree weather in their yard died of heat stroke. Now many of us, and I know people in South Jersey, I lived in the South, you lived in the South. Yes. You have, to, you have to go about your business in 92 degree weather. You can't right. sit there and stay at home. But I don't think people are realizing that with the impact of increased um, air pollution, their own age, and um, another one they haven't commented on, the amount of time we're living at a higher temperature. Let me comment on that one. Uh, there's more awareness of this uh, as each day passes, but in a way, it's not the high temperature during the day that's the bigger danger to human health. It's the high temperature in the middle of the night. So every human thing or every living thing needs a rest period, needs downtime to replenish. Different animals, different plants do it in different ways. If you're living in my hometown of, original hometown of Patterson or uh, Trenton or Camden, where it doesn't cool off at night, those humans in that town spend that evening warm. And they spend that evening and the clock is ticking, they're supposed to be replenishing, but they actually don't replenish. The mm. next day comes, it's only 92. They go out, they try to live their life, but they haven't had a renewal cycle overnight. So uh, as the temperatures get hot and stay hot, people will not really be replenished and they will actually be more vulnerable to heat damage uh, as they do their activities of daily living. Um, thank you, Doctor. Um, if you have any questions uh, that you've written down, uh, Selma will collect them here and we'll get to them in just a second here. Um, and I appreciate your, uh, your questions, your comments. Uh, if there are any of them, please uh, hand them to, uh, to Selma right here or just feel free to go over to the microphone here in just a few minutes. Uh, doctor, one more question about that. Um, it, it, it seems that the, the incidence of uh, respiratory illnesses, and especially among children, um, it, it seems that there, there's a higher incidence now. Um, 
I'm, I'm almost always of the impression, is it something that we're ingesting, something we're eating? Is it a result of climate change, your estimation? What, what do you think? Well, this is uh, some of the answers we heard earlier about uh, either um, uh, the salinity of different areas yes. of the uh, coastline or uh, what is happening with the oysters or other fisheries. I think you can actually apply this to humans. This is not necessarily a one-on-one -on -one link, uh, but as um, the air gets warmer, or there is more particulate matter in the air, right. people who would be sensitive to um, air pollution, if there is more air pollution around, they're going to react to it. Right. So if it's warmer, and uh, we haven't really talked about insects uh, this evening, but we could, as a lot of the sure. people... Yes. Um, uh, will, there will be more time if the spring starts earlier and there's a longer season, there will be plenty of time for insects to become uh, more prolific. But one of the things that also happens is that cockroaches that can live and uh, create what's called co uh, pleasantly cockroach dander, which is really crushed cockroaches, but yeah. there's a pleasant, pleasant title for it, uh, that actually sensitizes the, the lungs of the young and is one of the direct correlates of increased asthma yes. in the young. So more cockroaches, more asthma, more particulate matter, that asthmatic has a reaction. So it is a complex web of, uh, of the world we live in. The insects were around, the exposures were exposed to, and then the human products of consumption that come out of the uh, end of exhaust pipes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, thank you, Doctor. Dr. Monroe, on this subject, what keeps you up at night? <laughs> um, I sleep really well. <laughs> <I'm kidding. laughs> um, no, I think um, one of the things that I think a lot about in terms of the, you know, the things I study and, and climate change, I think a lot about how um, what the future is going to look like for some of these really important coastal food production systems. So um, we're sitting here in Cape May tonight. Um, we're in the heart of some major commercial fishing um, the major commercial fishing industries here in New Jersey. And a lot of people don't realize that those major commercial fisheries are shellfish. It's clams mm -hmm. and, um, you know, it's, it's, not, it's not things with fins and scales. It's things with shells. Um, and so I think a lot about what those things will look like uh, over, you know, the next decade or 20 to 40 years. Um, and one of the things that I'm encouraged by, um, and I, I, was, I wrote down a couple notes uh, just listening to the story about the Princeton Climate Action Plan, and one of the things I heard in what you were saying was this really brilliant idea of um, adaptation through community, right? So, so having the community look out for each other, and that's how you adapt. And in the fishing and aquaculture groups I work with, and I get to, I'm fortunate to be on the water with these people, I see them doing that. They're very much a community that's adapting. They're very aware. Um, they've, they've, they're always ready to ad adjust their business models to, make, you know, to maintain, uh, keep up with the changes they're seeing. They're reaching out to the science community for help with that. Um, and so I, I, I worry about it, but um, I see a lot of a lot of agility in those industries, those food production systems, and you know, and we heard from one of the audience members, you know, making choices about um, our food and how it's grown and produced. Uh, shellfish is a really, really green choice as far as the type of food you can choose to eat, and we're fortunate here in New Jersey to have commercial fishing and aquaculture that supplies those very green protein sources um, yeah. locally as well. So. Um, Great. Thank you, Dr. Dr. Tedesco. On this subject, climate change and what we're going through, what keeps you up at night? So I sit in an office and I look out over probably 14,000 acres of marsh, and I say to myself, what is tomorrow? What does the future look like, right? And I look out my window, and I grew up, I spent my whole life, you know, with my toes in the mud, if you will, in, in marshes. And when you look at some of those numbers and you think about, okay, if we're going to have another 1.8 feet of rise by 2050, and if you want to look out to 2100, we're talking maybe four feet of rise if we don't do something pretty dramatically. There isn't four feet of elevation out there. That's pretty dramatic when you think about it that way. And then I, I think about the rate of change of these ecosystems and all the, the wonderful 
diversity of life and the richness that's out there that I see, and I think that's not going to be there. Um, I don't want to be, you know, alarmist, but but what is going to be there, right? It's going to be dramatically different, and I kind of think about can we survive the wildfire? I mean, the, the, the rate of change is too fast, I think, for some of the adaptations. In my mind, I, I'm not a biologist, but I think about it. I'm a geologist, so I have this long-term view of things. Right? I, I get deep time. And, um, and I think some of these, we're pushing the rate of change. So I spend a lot of my time um, trying to help things survive what I'm thinking of as the wildfire. So we're building places for birds to take refuge that are losing nests constantly to flooding, so they're not successful at breeding. So we're trying to do things, and I, I really do liken it to surviving the wildfire, to give them a chance when all of this goes by for what ecosystems will be next, that maybe they can repopulate it. But I, that's what keeps me up. I look out my window, and I know it's going to be pretty darn different, and, um, and we're going to lose a lot mm -hmm. in that changeover. Mm -hmm. Jenny, what keeps you up on this subject? What, uh, what, what keeps you up at night? I had a feeling that question was coming my yes. way. <laughs> um, I would have to say I have a, a one-year-old son, and so I think about what will his world look like in a similar vein um, to the others have mentioned and what career opportunities that are different from career opportunities today will he have and how will his world look different? Um, what will the coastlines look like? Will he need to move, live in the mountains? I don't know. I think of these things and how just um, the world will be different uh, as it moves on, so in some ways, um, I'm sure better, um, but just how things may adapt and change with the world. Better because we're aware of what's taking place and we're doing things about it? There's always advancements in technologies, right. and um, I think society has an opportunity to make some big shifts, and so I'm sure there will be better, better times in some ways ahead. Good. We've got some great questions. You want to get to some of them here. Um, this first one, uh, what modification can we as individuals make to have a significant impact on global warming? Dr. Tedesco or anyone? Um, well, I, I would go back to the conversation about mitigation versus adaptation. I think it's a combination of things. I mean, to, to look at your own personal footprint and the ways that you can reduce um, I think is dramatic. I think it's going to take a thousand small steps. Um, but I also think that we need a voice. I mean, if we put as much energy as society into solving some of these things, into adapting instead of arguing about and fighting about it, um, we'd probably get somewhere. So that's what I'm just dumbfounded by the fact that we're still having a conversation with people that are denying climate change. It's like, that, so I, I, I struggle with that energy level, but I think as individuals to... Why do you think um, there is that denial? I'm just curious. Well, I don't know. I don't want to get political, but I think... Um, oh, go ahead. I, well, <laughs> but it doesn't... But it tends to turn people off. The problem is... <clears throat> the problem with that is that people uh, stop listening, and those are the people we're trying to, trying to have listen. So I don't know that that's super productive. But um, I think it's, a, it's guarding wealth, I mean, in some ways. And the folks that are driving those levers, are, they don't want to see change. And, and they're spending a lot of time creating doubt. Um, scientists, you know, we're part of the problem. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm part of that problem because a scientist, unfortunately or fortunately, will always tell you the uncertainty of what they know and don't know, right? And they'll always tell you exactly what the answer is. You would never go in to a negotiation and put the final number on the table, right? That's what scientists do. We tell you what the number is, and we tell you how sure we are about the number. That's the nature of it. So we always end up not anywhere close to what you need to happen because it gets compromised away. And people like to focus on the uncertainty of, of that conversation. So I, I think that's part of it. We haven't done a great job communicating it, but I also think that there's a lot of money in this game and a lot of people that stand to, to potentially lose money if we have to move away from... Let's just start with the oil and gas. I mean, there, so I think there's just a lot of money manipulating and creating confusion. And, and, you know, the same folks that tried to convince us that cigarettes didn't kill you are the same people that are behind trying to convince us that climate isn't changing. I mean, when are we going to wake up to that? Mm -hmm. Thank you, Doctor. Here's another question. Sorry. How have the media in Cape May County impacted the dialogue about climate change? Are media outlets being diligent enough to cover this issue in a Republican county? Anyone? That's, I'm, I'm just reading the question. <laughs> Anyone? 
Maybe somebody in the audience can better answer this. <laughs> okay, no takers on that one. All right. I mean, let me just say, the, yes. only, the only reason I wouldn't answer that question is that I just don't know right. how they're covering it in Cape May County. Right. So, uh, I, you know, we, 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 it's tough to make it up, right? You know, you just say, well, who knows? But uh, it, it is a challenge. Uh, do you really look... Um, well, the comment of community as an adaptation environment. Um, I don't think this is one where we're looking for the media to lead us. And so let's say the media for the, to uh, make the presumption of that question. Okay, the media doesn't exactly have it right in Cape May County. To me, that wouldn't, those wouldn't be the people I was looking at to help lead us out of this mess. The media has a certain role it's playing, that's great, but I would be looking towards community groups, religious groups, uh, non-religious groups, other groups in the community that can band together and do things. I don't see the media as that cohesive force for both better and worse. The media is reporting things, maybe the media can report on these community efforts. That would be what I would encourage them, people to do. Get you, know, you know, Dr. Along those lines, and the same thing, uh, Dr. Tedesco, <clears throat> I was involved in a conversation not that long ago. I, I forget where it was. <clears throat> and the conversation uh, uh, went to the point that at the, the highest office in the land, there is a, there's a doubter about climate change. And, and how people think, oh, that's just awful. It's just, oh, it's just really bad. It's not good. For... But on the other hand, if it's coming from this high office where this high office is doubting, doubting the science of this, then it's almost, as you say, Dr. Tedesco, like uh, Hurricane Sandy. To a certain extent, it's a wake-up call for individuals, for nonprofits, for scientists, for researchers, and to make sure that because there's this doubt to make sure that, okay, here's the science, here are the facts, here are things that you can do about it. Same thing you were talking about, doctor, like uh, 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 Princeton enacting this uh, climate action plan and so forth. So even though the, the, the highest office of the land, the occupant may think that, that oh, it's just all nonsense. And, well, I, and I would flip that one uh, if I was talking to somebody who brought up the highest office in the land and their, their reaction to climate change, I would say, so you're waiting for the President of the United right. States to lead your community in adapting to right. climate change? If you're going to wait for that, no matter who is the President, that person is not going to lead your community in adapting to climate change. Right. It could be the world's perfect person as President and Cape May County, Lower Township, Middle Township, Upper Township, there's going to have to be community leaders that do it, no matter who's quote-unquote running things. There's a lot that that person who's running things can do, but ad adapting your community and leading mitigation efforts in your community, to me, those are not things that that highest office is going to right. do. So it frees you from feeling frozen by the current state of affairs. You basically break free from worrying about what those people way above your head are doing and say, we have to do this anyway, no matter what other people are doing. It sounds like, for instance, the fishermen aren't waiting for Trenton to lead. Right. You know, it's, if you probably said that to a fisherman, they'd probably laugh at you. Are you guys waiting for Trenton to lead? They'd get hysterical in laughter and say, no, we have to do this ourselves. Right. You're exactly right, um, because they, they're there day to day on the water. They don't have time to check in and see if there's political leadership about whether or not they manage to adapt to what they're seeing on sub, you know, sub-annual scales or things like that. Right. Yeah. So you have a question for us? Well, it's actually a little defense of uh, <clears throat> a little defense of Cape May County. Go right ahead. And the communities here. And I just, uh, I endorse what you're saying about local municipalities taking action. And I just think if you travel from northern New Jersey and you get into Cape May County, that you should recognize 
the efforts that have been taken by the municipalities in Cape May County and by the Cape May County itself to make this such a beautiful county and to protect its beaches, protect its environment, the Green Acres programs that have been very effective mm -hmm. in preserving farmland in this county. Also, from a media standpoint, even though sometimes I have <clears throat> my own uh, fights with the media, I think the fact is that the media front page today of the Herald is about water in Cape May County and the preservation of fresh water. Mm -hmm. um, and in the Star and Wave uh, is an article about uh, the environment <clears throat> in Cape May City. Uh, from a municipality, I'm commissioner in Cape May Point. And I would say there may not be a municipality in the state of New Jersey that is more effective in preserving the, um, the environment as Cape May Point. We have only 200 and some acres. But as a municipality, we have some of the most gorgeous uh, dunes in the state of New Jersey. Mm. Our dune system is some of which are over 30 feet tall. And it was because the municipality decided 30 years ago to not be so concerned with seeing the ocean as protecting the environment. And we also allow foliage on that dune to that dune system to grow. And now we have one of the great maritime forests developing within the state of New Jersey. I think it should actually be the starting point for the New Jersey maritime forest and dune system that should go all the way up the coast. But if you visit Cape May Point, you will see this system in place. It's also the second best birding location for predatory birds in North America. And so it's important that that park system that is there and also for the municipality itself that has decided that it is going to only allow 40% of a property to be developed. 60% of that has to be in foliage. We also have a freshwater lake, 12 acres, that was famous in Europe as the explorers came to the United States. And that community has made every effort to keep that 12-acre freshwater lake fresh. And it has done that to this date, spending hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars over the years. We also have the monarch butterfly migration that comes through. And so the town has put together monarch butterfly gardens throughout the town. They have uh, plants and foliage that attract mutter, uh, monarch butterflies and a number of other species that come through uh, Cape May Point. So I just want to say this. I think it's important to recognize municipalities that take those efforts. Mm -hmm. And they take those efforts because the people of the town are the ones that make those decisions mm -hmm. to give up building border to border on their individual lots, and that they also take the efforts, as they have with the dunes, to plant those dunes at no cost to the state of New Jersey, to protect the town, and to provide a now habitat for a number of species that are now in those dunes, and we don't allow people within those dunes. So we also hear a lot about ecotourism. And in Cape May Point, we don't build monarch butterfly gardens for tourists. We build them for monarch butterflies. And I think that's a very important point as the state of New Jersey does these parks and recreational areas that they understand that they are done for nature rather than for more amusement. So thank you very much. Good. Thank you, sir. Thank <laughs> you.
We also have in the audience Zach Mullock. He's a, a council member in Cape, City of Cape May. And we also have former Mayor Ed Mahaney in the audience as well. And we had the current mayor as well, um, Mayor Clarence Lear, who um, was here just a short while ago but had a, another another engagement. Um, this is along the lines of the question we were just uh, we just uh, just heard about. Um, <clears throat> this comes from the audience. Why are there no big efforts by the government, <clears throat> pardon me, to mandate conservation? Is it the mighty dollar? Anyone? Why are there no big efforts by the government to mandate conservation? I'll take a sort of stab at that. I'm not sure that's an accurate statement. Okay. Um, I think it de depends on which government scale you want to talk about. Um, but certainly the current governor of New Jersey is working very hard in mandating uh, switch to, to sustainable energy use and putting in, you know, looking at major, major power initiatives, offshore wind. Um, so there are some efforts to do that. Um, certainly the, the boroughs of Stone Harbor and Avalon have, have legislated um, plastics reduce use. And so I think there are a lot of initiatives in a lot of places. We just heard a, a bunch. So I think there's a bunch of different scales of government. But I, I don't know that I would agree that that's a correct statement. Maybe we'd like to see more on different scales or more broad reaching, but I don't know that. Great. Thank you, Doctor. Uh, question over here from the audience. Yes, sir. <clears throat> Hi. Uh, I've got actually a series of questions. Should I read them all at once? They're not related, but... Do you want to come up and moderate, sir? <laughs> sure. <laughs> um, first one, the, the geologist. Why is New Jersey sinking? What is the geology behind that? The, um, largely, it's related to the last glacial ice age. And so to the north of us, we had, you know, several miles of ice that weighs a lot. That kind of, think about your mattress, it pressed down. So the pressure's released. And as it was released, it's rising, but there's a hinge point. So the, the area of, of New Jersey, kind of north of, uh, maybe north of Tom's River, is bouncing up, so it's lifting up, whereas there's a hinge. And when it did that, the part to the south is dropping down. Okay. So it's sinking because it's just a flex. It's a structural flex of the crust. Okay, thank you. Um, you know, one of, one of the problems we have with non-believers, too, is that the weather was probably the hottest. The last couple of weeks have been brutal. And the, one of the first things they say was, the last time we had weather like this was 1930. So, so uh, you know, if you're an unbeliever and you hear that, well, you figure well, this is just a regular occurrence. You know, how do we combat that type of thought? Well, I, I can tell you how I work on this, which has some analogies to dealing with patients. Uh, you know, it was long, a while ago I saw patients, but I don't think they've changed that much. One is, I, if I confront someone like that, uh, I make first an academic point. I said, now you remember there's a difference. They don't always remember this. There's a difference in climate and weather. Yes. Weather is what happened today, what happened yesterday. Climate is what happens over a period of ex some extended period of time, somewhere between an individual day and then the geological time frame. You know, it's, it's longer than, the, it's shorter than the geological time frame, but it's some extended period of time. So when we look at some of these uh, measures, not the one we saw, but of temperature, you'll see a lot of variation in the specific temperature of a year, but then you'll see a gradual rise in the mean temperature over a period of 10 years. And so I try to focus the person, if you will, reorient the person from the weather of the past day or the past couple of weeks to the climate over some period of years. If that doesn't work, and a lot of times it doesn't work, uh, I at least take some, uh, I, I try to remember that the patients I talk to about their illnesses, and I'm making an analogy to the illness of the planet here. Some of the patients I talked to were very accepting of their illness. So, you know, I get it, doc. I'm going to change. You know, now I'm going to quit smoking. I'm going to get on a diet. I'm going to stop putting salt on my food. And other patients were, you know, Doc, I don't believe a word you're saying. I'm going to keep eating hamburgers. I don't care. I'm going to keep smoking because I knew my uncle smoked and he never got lung cancer. And my father ate burgers and he never had a heart attack. Not everybody is going to hear the story 
and change their behavior. And you can see that in how they deal with their own health, let alone the health of an abstract at some distant to them. If you can't get people to change when their own life is at stake, it's hard to get them to change when somebody else's life is at stake, not their own. So you, that second one, I guess, is an acceptance level. Try to get them to change. If they're not going to change, you may have to move on to the next person and try to convince them. Mm -hmm. You and have that, another question, sir? Can I, can I ask another one? Sure. Yes, go ahead, please. Okay. One of the, I think one of the big problems with our country, too, is we've, we've, we've designed this country so that everybody can have an individual car and go their way. And when you, it just amazes me when I look at the highways and see the thousands and thousands of cars that are traveling this way and that way. And we, we, how do we change that mindset? Uh, th that's one of our big problems. I think a third of, the, of our, our, our carbon dioxide pollution is coming from cars, electric cars. I heard the woman mention that she had an electric car. I think that's one of the ways to do it. But how to... And, sir, let me, let, me, let me build on that. Not just thousands and thousands of cars, but thousands and thousands of cars with only one person in it. How do we change that? Um, I'll um, make a comment um, and not necessarily give you a solution. But um, I, in, uh, when I was growing up, I didn't know, none of my friends would have even thought of graduating high school without getting a car. <laughs> and today, the undergraduates who come to work in my lab, and my lab is remote, you almost have to have a car right <laughs> down here because there's not a lot of public transit. Um, and I struggle to find students who own a car. Um, and these are young people in their early 20s. And so I think there may already be a shift, um, and it's not my generation. It's maybe Jenny's generation, but even younger than that, that young people are choosing not to own vehicles. And so they're mm -hmm. choosing alternatives already. And, um, and so I, I, I think um, we can help to foster that potentially. But um, from my perspective, I'm seeing a big change in how young people interact with the automobile. Yeah. Great. Thank you, sir. I have a couple more quick questions here from the audience. Uh, have the shellfish... Have the oyster shell collection efforts of Ocean and Atlantic counties expanded? Anybody know? Um, can, can I get clarification on what shell collection is meant there? Is that, Have the oyster shell collection? Am I going to explain you, that? You yes, ma'am. You mean harvest? Yeah, shell recycling. Oh. Yep. Right. Gotcha. Thank you. Yep. Um, so uh, the question is about um, shell recycling programs. So taking used shell from restaurants, so when you get at your plate of delicious locally grown or locally fished oysters, and those shells then, not, rather than having them go into landfill, have them collected and then put back and used in restoration efforts, like um, Jenny was talking about. Um, I, th I have seen an expansion of that um, for sure. I don't know. Jenny may be able to speak more to that. I know there's been some stuff going on across the bay in Delaware. Um, I think Stockton has expanded some of the work they're doing, and there's some additional stuff going on in Atlantic City. Um, and, and these efforts are like similar to some of the things that Jenny talked about, about, um, you know, uh, coastal sustainable or uh, coastal uh, restoration initiatives. These are hard programs to run because they're not, they're expensive. Um, you need to be picking this shell up very frequently because it's stinky. <laughs> the restaurant doesn't want to have a stinky pile of oyster shells sitting out back um, for very long. And so they're really labor intensive and, and um, they do rely a lot on volunteers and, and you know, a community of people to make them, make them effective. But I'm going to let Jenny speak to this as well if you yeah, just uh, really quickly to add to that, um, I think there is an expansion of the shell recycling programs in New Jersey and also elsewhere. There's recycling programs in Wilmington and the Philadelphia area as well. And so I think a really key part of that is to get students and the community involved in not only collecting the shells when possible on, on schedule and on times, but then implementing the projects and creating that hook potentially for students to be stewards and, and care for their environment in a hands-on way. Great. Ma'am, I see you have a question, too. I also see you have a, a 
Yes, no, I well, like my I'm, I'm, I'm hard of hearing. I'm okay. sorry, so I can't quite understand you. All right. Um, but I wanted to respond to a comment that you made. You said, do they know what is at stake? Yes. Because I think this is really important, but I, I've been an educator all my life, and yes. I know what's at stake. Um, education is at stake. I would like to see an educator here this evening telling us about the curriculum that begins at pre-K all the way through high school, about how all of the things that you said they need to learn about and they need to learn what they can do. Because if we don't start with our children, yes. then it's not going to happen. But public education, unfortunately, is very slow to change. But I, I guess what I want to say to you as you speak to other people, that that should be a point that's made that if we don't change how we teach our children and what we teach our children, then they're not going to adapt very well to climate change. So as far as I'm concerned, that's where it needs to begin. That's it. Jenny? Yes. Thank you, ma'am. I have just a small comment on that. Um, point in that on a, on a small scale, we do incorporate actual scientific research out of our lab and other colleagues uh, into lessons that are used in local schools and um, correlated with the next generation science standards. So um, from our outreach efforts, we do make an effort to include currently collected um, data for the students to analyze and make some of their own conclusions and um, a more engaging classroom lesson perhaps that's relevant and localized. But again, that's not on a state scale mandated across curricula for all grades. So it's, it's difficult to, to cross into all of those sectors. Thank you, Jenny. Final question from the audience here, uh, the written question. What is the meth method of harvesting shellfish? Is the industry sustainable? Are other species incidentally taken? Uh, so the oyster fishery in the Delaware Bay, the New Jersey oyster fishery, uses uh, dredges to harvest oysters. Um, they, there may be a small amount of um, incidental catch, but it's really small. Um, we're not talking about huge dredges. Um, they're able to throw things back overboard pretty quickly. Um, and in fact, uh, that fishery has been stable for about 12 years, um, stable in terms of their catch and their quota. Abundance has been increasing in that fishery, the abundance of the oysters that are out there. And so we do, in fact, um, call that a sustainable fishery. Um, uh, we do the uh, science, the assessment, and then the state, of course, makes the management decisions. And in all of that, the fishermen are at the table. And I think that's one of the things that makes it a really, um, you know, really kind of speaks to the sustainability of it, is these, these fishermen sit in the room and hear the science and, and look at our data and, and are really quite engaged. You know, they, they have long-term business plans that rely on the sustainability of that stock. And so... Um, uh, that that's one, and I, I also work with the scallop fish, the federal scallop fishery that um, lands uh, product here in Cape May, and the cl federal clam fisheries. Uh, both of those are also dredge fisheries. Uh, in terms of the federal clam fishery, there is almost zero bycatch in that fishery. It's a very very clean fishery. Um, both the scallop and clam fisheries, uh, those federal fisheries, are managed under Magnus and Stevens, which is a federal. Um, uh, uh, federal legislation and the question earlier about conservation I would agree, agree with um, Dr. Tedesco that you know that fishery legislation in the US is the some of the strongest in the world um, and that aims to conserve those fished stocks and and so um, in terms of uh, those two fisheries as well scallops and clams here in, that are landed here in Cape May um, both of those are very stable fisheries have been stable over a very very long period of time um, and that, again, suggests sustainability. Um, so that's fine. Thank you, Dr. Monroe. Yes, sir? First of all, thank you for taking time out of your busy professional schedules to be here with us in our community. And I'd like to build on what Mr. Mullick said earlier uh, from uh, Cape May Point. Cape Island itself, to open the aperture a little larger, is three miles by three miles by three miles. 
uh, but it is an island since the intercoastal waterway was cut through, which lowered the water table by about 20 feet. And uh, I'd like to plant a seed of good for this forum, uh, an idea to come out of the swarm from me. And that would be each of our four municipalities that make up Cape Island. That would be Lower Township, City of Cape May, West Cape May, and Cape May Point. They each of these municipalities has an environmental commission. But there's no singular entity that could come up with a climate action plan for Cape Island. So each of the environmental commissions of our four municipalities could produce one person from their commission to serve on a Cape Island environmental commission for an adaptive plan. And that's the idea. And perhaps even that group could generate a grant for Stockton, Rutgers, that uh, further studies could be made uh, to mitigate and adapt to climate change. Great. Thank you, sir. We're going to play one more piece from our documentary, Peril and Promise. Let's, uh, let's take a look and see what this is. When it comes to shoring up the state against forces of nature unleashed by climate change, Superstorm Sandy may have put New Jersey ahead of the game. Its catastrophic toll on infrastructure built for past centuries spurred municipalities and utilities to start building to survive the next century. Utility firms have spent billions to harden their infrastructure. PSE&G elevating this entire substation in Hoboken by 10 feet to 16 feet above sea level and redesigning the entire power grid to withstand extreme weather and has replaced all its cast iron natural gas mains with PVC plastic piping. The Salem and Hope Creek nuclear plants are considered in safe zones. The Port Authority says its new Terminal 1 being built at Newark Airport has been engineered following the latest guidelines for sustainability and resiliency. <clears throat> the one thing, the one thing you think needs to be done right now that would have a huge impact in the next 5 to 10 to 15 years. Who would like to go first? On, on ad, I'll, I'll, I'll toss the question back, or at least for a modification. On adaptation or on mitigation? You choose. Um, well, I'll, even though I'm, an, I'm mostly an advocate on the adaptation of humans to the climate change, I'll actually talk about, say, mitigation. Okay. Um, and throw a concept out there for people that, again, may be useful. And that is what's called disproportionate climate impact. And this is, this is kind of a way of thinking where you um, sit there and say, you know, I'm not going to buy a plastic water bottle today. That'll save the planet. And you feel good that you didn't buy a plastic water bottle, and then you, gotta, you get on a plane and you fly to Los Angeles. Now, there's a disproportionate climate impact there. Your behavior in protecting the planet and not buying a plastic water bottle is outdistanced by a 1,000 miles, or actually, in this analogy, 3,000 miles, <laughs> by going to L.A. So a thing that I think is that people need to get they wrap their heads around, in terms of mitigation, what their behaviors really impact climate. And that would be the, the, literally the size of your house and the amount of energy that it's consuming, the size of your car and the amount of energy it's consuming, and the various behaviors you do, like flying, and the stuff that we spend perhaps too much focus on is where am I putting this newspaper? Where am I putting this plastic bottle? If you're not talking about those big things in your life, you're missing the point on mitigation. And so that's what I would have people focus on. Their big consumption activities, keep doing those smaller things, but focus on your big consumption activities. 
I'm going to have NJTV get rid of my car, and I'm going to start traveling by stagecoach. Don't travel by stagecoach. Travel by electric or hybrid vehicle. Well, there you go. With someone else. Yes, you, doctor. Um, doctor Tedesco, the one thing, five, ten, twenty years down the road, you could see having a, 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 a big impact? People have to raise their voice and really demand change. Because yeah. that's the only thing that ever gets anything done, right, is the people saying it's time to do something. And, and I think that's where we're at, personally. Because I, I think for different people, there's a lot of different ways to do it. We can ask our government to do certain things, and they're going to have to do things. We need public-private partnerships. And we talked about changing our infrastructure. All of those things need to be done. But they're, they need, we, we just, as a country, as a, as, a, as a society, we need to demand change. Good. Jenny? This is a big picture topic, but I think um, yeah. global efforts, obviously, is a, the primary goal here. But I think um, global efforts need to be more concerted in um, mitigating these efforts and working together as best as other countries can work together in terms of um, assisting some of these larger, larger scale issues. You're saying put the politics aside and get to what's really important? Um, I think in terms of myself included, sometimes we live in a bubble, a United States bubble, and um, there's a lot of global issues going on that are of much larger scale of some of the issues we're facing. And so I think those are um, also important in looking long term. Mm -hmm. Dr. Monroe? I'm having to follow three really great ideas. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm going to um, reflect something that was uh, brought up by the audience, and that's education mm -hmm. um, and awareness. And I think, and that doesn't just mean, you know, hope, you know putting efforts forward to all, adjust K through 12 education, but all of us educating ourselves and um, helping to educate others around us and d doing it in a way that's, that doesn't create tension and confrontation. It's hard not to be emotional. We see these images like we've been looking at tonight. It's hard not to get really amped up. Um, but having, having a conversation that can help increase awareness and, and truly educate, um, I think you need to bring it to a level that actually w the conversation can happen. Good. How about a hand for our panel, folks? <laughs> Dr. D. Ferdinando, Jenny Chin, Dr. Monroe, Dr. Tedesco, thank you very much. You've been fantastic, and you have been an incredible audience. I appreciate your questions and your comments and your concerns that you have shared with us uh, for this Facing the Future of Climate Change in New Jersey, an event made possible by the folks here at uh, Lower Cape May Regional High School, John Dretchen, Jenny Lane, and Mark Mallett, uh, certainly the folks at TEDx Cape May, and certainly uh, the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation for giving us the kind of support to put on this kind of event. I want to remind you once again that uh, you have audience evaluation sheets with you. Please, if you would, kindly fill those out for us uh, so that we may be able to, uh, to connect with you. I want to thank the mayor for coming here. Also, uh, Zach Malik, the city of Cape May council member and former mayor, uh, Ed Mahaney uh, as well. And I certainly want to thank my uh, team at NJ uh, TV. Uh, Ed, Edward Kip Jackson, who's on the camera there. Uh, volunteer Alexander um, Enriquez, Enriquez, I got that right. Deb Falk, our communications manager, and the person who works diligently night and day to put this together is our uh, community engagement manager, uh, Selma Bettencourt. I'm Michael Hill of NJTV News, and once again, thank you. Thank you for coming, and safe drive home. Mm-hmm.